The Iliad. By Robert Fitzgerald. Book 1. Quarrel, Oath, and Promise. Anger be now your song, immortal one, Achilles' anger, doomed and ruinous, that caused the Achaeans' loss on bitter loss and crowded brave souls into the undergloom, leaving so many dead men carrion for dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was done. Begin it when the two men first contending broke with one another the Lord Marshal Agamemnon, Atreus' son, and Prince Achilles. Among the gods, who brought this quarrel on? The son of Zeus by Leto. Agamemnon angered him, so he made a burning wind of plague rise in the army, rank and file sickened and died for the ill their chief had done in despising a man of prayer. This priest, Chryses, had come down to the ships with gifts, no end of ransom for his daughter, on a golden staff he carried the gods' white bands and sued for grace from the men of all Achaia, the two atreid I most of all, O captains Menelos and Agamemnon, and you other Achaeans under arms. The gods who hold Olympos, may they grant you plunder of Priam's town and a fair wind home, but let me have my daughter back for ransom as you revere Apollo, son of Zeus. Then all the soldiers murmured their assent, behave well to the priest. And take the ransom. But Agamemnon would not. It went against his desire, and brutally he ordered the man away, let me not find you here by the long ships loitering this time or returning later, old man, if I do, the staff and ribbons of the god will fail you. Give up the girl? I swear she will grow old at home in Argos, far from her own country, working my loom and visiting my bed. Leave me in peace and go, while you can, in safety. So harsh he was, the old man feared and obeyed him, in silence trailing away by the shore of the tumbling clamorous whispering sea, and he prayed and prayed again, as he withdrew, to the god whom silken braided Leto bore, O oh, hear me, master of the silver bow, protector of Tenedos and the holy towns, Apollo, Smynthian. If to your liking ever in any grove I roofed a shrine or burnt thigh bones in fat upon your altar bullock or goat flesh let my wish come true, your arrows on the Danans for my tears. Now when he heard this prayer, Phoebus Apollo walked with storm in his heart from Olympo's crest, quiver, and bow at his back, and the bundled arrows clanged on the sky behind as he rocked in his anger, descending like night itself. Apart from the ships he halted and let fly, and the bowstring slammed as the silver bow sprang, rolling in thunder away. Pack animals were his target first, and dogs, but soldiers, too, soon felt transfixing pain from his hard shots, and pyres burned night and day. Nine days the arrows of the god came down broadside upon the army. On the tenth, Achilles called all ranks to assembly. Hera, whose arms are white as ivory, moved him to it, as she took pity on Danan's dying. All being mustered, all in place and quiet, Achilles, fast in battle as a lion, rose and said, Agamemnon, now, I take it, the siege is broken, we are going to sail, and even so may not leave death behind, if war spares anyone, disease will take him. We might, though, ask some priest or some diviner, even some fellow good at dreams for dreams come down from Zeus as well why all this anger of the god Apollo? Has he some quarrel with us for a failure in vows or hecatombs? Would mutton burned or smoking goat flesh make him lift the plague? Putting the question, down he Saturday. And Calchas, Calchas Thesterides, came forward, wisest by far of all who scanned the flight of birds. He knew what was, what had been, what would be, Calchas, who brought Achaia's ships to Ilion by the diviner's gift Apollo gave him. Now for their benefit he said, Achilles, dear to Zeus, it is on me you call to tell you why the archer god is angry. Well, I can tell you. Are you listening? Swear by heaven that you will back me and defend me, because I fear my answer will enrage a man with power in Argos, one whose word Achaean troops obey. A great man in his rage is formidable for underlings, though he may keep it down, he cherishes the burning in his belly until a reckoning day. Think well if you will save me. Said Achilles, courage. Tell what you know, what you have liked to know. I swear by Apollo, the Lord God to whom you pray when you uncover truth, never while I draw breath, while I have eyes to see, shall any man upon this beachhead dare lay hands on you not one of all the army, not Agamemnon, if it is he you mean, though he is first in rank of all Achaeans. The diviner then took heart and said, no failure in hecatombs or vows is held against us. It is the man of prayer whom Agamemnon treated with contempt, he kept his daughter, spurned his gifts, for that man's sake the archer visited grief upon us and will again. Relieve the Danans of this plague he will not until the girl who turns the eyes of men shall be restored to her own father freely, with no demand for ransom and until we offer up a hecatom at cries. Then only can we calm him and persuade him. He finished and sat down. 
the son of Atreus, ruler of the Great Plain, Agamemnon, rose, furious. Round his heart resentment welled, and his eyes shone out like licking fire. Then, with a long and boding look at Calchas, he growled at him, you visionary of hell, never have I had fair play in your forecasts. Calamity is all you care about, or see, no happy portents, and you bring to pass nothing agreeable. Here you stand again before the army, giving it out as Oracle the archer made them suffer because of me, because I would not take the gifts and let the girl Chrysais go, I'd have her mine, at home. Yes, if you like, I rate her higher than Clytemistra, my own wife. She loses nothing by comparison in beauty or womanhood, in mind or skill. For all of that, I am willing now to yield her if it is best, I want the army saved and not destroyed. You must prepare, however, a prize of honour for me, and at once, that I may not be left without my portion I, of all Argives. It is not fitting so. While every man of you looks on, my girl goes elsewhere. Prince Achilles answered him, Lord Marshal, most insatiate of men, how can the army make you a new gift? Where is our store of booty? Can you see it? Everything plundered from the towns has been distributed, should troops turn all that in? Just let the girl go, in the God's name, now, we'll make it up to you, twice over, three times over, on that day Zeus gives us leave to plunder Troy behind her rings of stone. Agamemnon answered, not that way will I be gulled, brave as you are, Achilles. Take me in, would you? Try to get around me? What do you really ask? That you may keep your own winnings, I am to give up mine and sit here wanting her? Oh, no, the army will award a prize to me and make sure that it measures up, or if they do not, I will take a girl myself, your own, or Ias, or Odysseus' prize. Take her, yes, to keep. The man I visit may choke with rage, well, let him. But this, I say, we can decide on later. Look to it now, we launch on the great sea a well-found ship, and get her manned with oarsmen, load her with sacrificial beasts and put aboard Chrysace in her loveliness. My deputy, Ias, Idomeneus, or Prince Odysseus, or you, Achilles, fearsome as you are, will make the hecatom and quiet the archer. Achilles frowned and looked at him, then said, you thick-skinned, shameless, greedy fool. Can any Achaean care for you, or obey you, after this on marches or in battle? As for myself, when I came here to fight, I had no quarrel with Troy or Trojan spearmen, they never stole my cattle or my horses, never in the black farmland of Thyre ravaged my crops. How many miles there are of shadowy mountains, foaming seas, between? No, no, we joined for you, you insolent boar, to please you, fighting for your brother's sake and yours, to get revenge upon the Trojans. You overlook this, dogface, or don't care, and now in the end you threaten to take my girl, a prize I sweated for, and soldiers gave me. Never have I had plunder like your own from any Trojan stronghold battered down by the Achaeans. I have seen more action hand to hand in those assaults than you have, but when the time for sharing comes, the greater share is always yours. Worn out with battle I carry off some trifle to my ships. Well, this time I make sail for home. Better to take now to my ships. Why linger, cheated of winnings, to make wealth for you? To this the high commander made reply, desert, if that's the way the wind blows. Will I beg you to stay on my account? I will not. Others will honour me, and Zeus who views the wide world most of all. No officer is hateful to my sight as you are, none given like you to faction, as to battle rugged you are, I grant, by some god's favour. Sail, then, in your ships, and lord it over your own battalion of myrmidons. I do not give a curse for you, or for your anger. But here is warning for you, Chrysais being required of me by Phoebos Apollo, she will be sent back in a ship of mine, manned by my people. That done, I myself will call for Briseis at your hut, and take her, flower of young girls that she is, your prize, to show you here and now who is the stronger and make the next man sick at heart if any think of claiming equal place with me. A pain like grief weighed on the son of Peleus, and in his shaggy chest this way and that the passion of his heart ran, should he draw longsword from hip, stand off the rest, and kill in single combat the great son of Atreus, or hold his rage in check and give it time. And as this tumult swayed him, as he slid the big blade slowly from the sheath, Athena came to him from the sky. The white-armed goddess, Hera, sent her, being fond of both, concerned for both men. And Athena, stepping up behind him, visible to no one except Achilles, gripped his red-gold hair. Startled, he made a half-turn, and he knew her upon the instant for Athena, terribly her grey eyes blazed at him. 
and speaking softly but rapidly aside to her he said, What now, O daughter of the God of heaven who bears the storm cloud, why are you here? To see the wolfishness of Agamemnon? Well, I give you my word, this time, and soon, he pays for his behavior with his blood. The grey-eyed goddess Athena said to him, It was to check this killing rage I came from heaven, if you will listen. Hera sent me, being fond of both of you, concerned for both. Enough, break off this combat, stay your hand upon the sword hilt. Let him have a lashing with words, instead, tell him how things will be. Here is my promise, and it will be kept, winnings three times as rich, in due season, you shall have in requital for his arrogance. But hold your hand. Obey. The great runner, Achilles, answered, nothing for it, goddess, but when you two immortals speak, a man complies, though his heart burst. Just as well. Honor the gods' will, they may honor ours. On this he stayed his massive hand upon the silver pommel, and the blade of his great weapon slid back in the scabbard. The man had done her bidding. Off to Olympos, gaining the air, she went to join the rest, the powers of heaven in the home of Zeus. But now the son of Peleus turned on Agamemnon and lashed out at him, letting his anger ride in execration, sack of wine, you with your cur's eyes and your antelope heart. You've never had the kidney to buckle on armor among the troops, or make a sortie with picked men oh, no, that way death might lie. Safer, by God, in the middle of the army is it not? To commandeer the prize of any man who stands up to you. Leech. Commander of trash. If not, I swear, you never could abuse one soldier more. But here is what I say, my oath upon it by this great staff, look, leaf or shoot it cannot sprout again, once lopped away from the log it left behind in the timbered hills, it cannot flower, peeled of bark and leaves, instead, Achaean officers in council take it in hand by turns, when they observe by the will of Zeus due order in debate, let this be what I swear by then, I swear a day will come when every Achaean soldier will groan to have Achilles back. That day you shall no more prevail on me than this dry wood shall flourish driven though you are and though a thousand men perish before the killer, Hector. You will eat your heart out, raging with remorse for this dishonor done by you to the bravest of Achaeans. He hurled the staff, studded with golden nails, before him on the ground. Then down he sat, and fury filled Agamemnon, looking across at him. But for the sake of both men Nestor arose, the Pylian's orator, eloquent and clear, argument sweeter than honey rolled from his tongue. By now he had outlived two generations of mortal men, his own and the one after, in Pylos' land, and still ruled in the third. In kind reproof he said, a black day, this. Bitter distress comes this way to Achaia. How happy Priam and Priam's sons would be, and all the Trojans wild with joy if they got wind of all these fighting words between you, foremost in council as you are, foremost in battle. Give me your attention. Both are younger men than I, and in my time men who were even greater have I known and none of them disdained me. Men like those I have not seen again, nor shall, Perithus, the Lord Marshal Dryas, Kynaeus, Exadios, Polyphemos, Theseus Ajo's son, a man like the immortal gods. I speak of champions among men of earth, who fought with champions, with wild things of the mountains, great centaurs whom they broke and overpowered. Among these men I say I had my place when I sailed out of Pylos, my far country, because they called for me. I fought for my own hand among them. Not one man alive now upon earth could stand against them. And I repeat, they listened to my reasoning, took my advice. Well, then, you take it too. It is far better so. Lord Agamemnon, do not deprive him of the girl, renounce her. The army had allotted her to him. Achilles, for your part, do not defy your king and captain. No one vies in honor with him who holds authority from Zeus. You have more prowess, for a goddess bore you, his power over men surpasses yours. But, Agamemnon, let your anger cool. I beg you to relent, knowing Achilles a sea wall for Achaeans in the black waves of war. Lord Agamemnon answered, All you say is fairly said, sir, but this man's ambition, remember, is to lead, to lord it over everyone, hold power over everyone, give orders to the rest of us. Well, one will never take his orders. If the gods who live forever made a spearman of him, have they put insults on his lips as well? Achilles interrupted, What a poltroon, how lilliliver I should be called, if I knuckled under to all you do or say. Give your commands to someone else, not me. 
And one more thing I have to tell you, think it over, this time, for the girl, I will not wrangle in arms with you or anyone, though I am robbed of what was given me, but as for any other thing I have alongside my black ship, you shall not take it against my will. Try it. Hear this, everyone, that instant your hot blood blackens my spear. They quarreled in this way, face to face, and then broke off the assembly by the ships. Achilles made his way to his squadron and his quarters, Patroclos by his side, with his companions. Agamemnon proceeded to launch a ship, assigned her twenty oarsmen, loaded beasts for sacrifice to the god, then set aboard Chrysace in her loveliness. The versatile Odysseus took the deck, and, all oars manned, they pulled out on the drenching ways of sea. The troops meanwhile were ordered to police camp and did so, throwing refuse in the water, then to Apollo by the barren surf they carried out full tally hecatoms, and the saver curled in crooked smoke toward heaven. That was the day's work in the army. Agamemnon had kept his threat in mind, and now he acted, calling Eurobates and Tolthibios, his aides and criers, go along, he said, both of you, to the quarters of Achilles and take his charming Briseis by the hand to bring to me. And if he balks at giving her I shall be there myself with men at arms in force to take her all the more gall for him. So, ominously, he sent them on their way, and they who had no stomach for it went along the way sea shingle toward the ships and shelters of the Myrmidons. Not far from his black ship and hut they found the prince in the open, seated. And seeing these two come was cheerless to Achilles. Shamefast, pale with fear of him, they stood without a word, but he knew what they felt and called out. Peace to you, criers and couriers of Zeus and men. Come forward. Not one thing have I against you, Agamemnon is the man who sent you for Briseis. Here then, my lord Patroclos, bring out the girl and give her to these men. And let them both bear witness before the gods who live in bliss, as before men who die, including this harsh king, if ever hereafter a need for me arises to keep the rest from black defeat and ruin. Lost in folly, the man cannot think back or think ahead how to come through a battle by the ships. Patroclos did the bidding of his friend, led from the hut Briseis in her beauty and gave her to them. Back along the ships they took their way, and the girl went, loath to go. Leaving his friends in haste, Achilles wept, and sat apart by the grey wave, scanning the endless sea. Often he spread his hands in prayer to his mother, as my life came from you, though it is brief, honour at least from Zeus who storms in heaven I call my due. He gives me precious little. See how the lord of the great plains, Agamemnon, humiliated me. He has my prize, by his own whim, for himself. Eyes wet with tears, he spoke, and her ladyship his mother heard him in green deeps where she lolled near her old father. Gliding she rose and broke like mist from the inshore grey sea face, to sit down softly before him, her son in tears, and fondling him she said, Child, why do you weep? What grief is this? Out with it, tell me, both of us should know. Achilles, fast in battle as a lion, groaned and said, Why tell you what you know? We sailed out raiding, and we took by storm that ancient town of Eshan called Thabe, plundered the place, brought slaves and spoils away. At the division, later, they chose a young girl, Chrysace, for the king. Then Chryses, priest of the archer god, Apollo, came to the beachhead we Achaeans hold, bringing no end of ransom for his daughter, he had the gods' white bands on a golden staff and sued for grace from the army of Achaia, mostly the two Atreidae, corps commanders. All of our soldiers murmured in assent, behave well to the priest. And take the ransom. But Agamemnon would not. It went against his desire, and brutally he ordered the man away. So the old man withdrew in grief and anger. Apollo cared for him, he heard his prayer and let black bolts of plague fly on the Argives. One by one our men came down with it and died hard as the god's shots raked the army broadside. But our priest divined the cause and told us what the god meant by plague. I said, appease the god, but Agamemnon could not contain his rage, he threatened me, and what he threatened is now done one girl the Achaeans are embarking now for Cry's beach with gifts for Lord Apollo, the other, just now, from my hut the criers came and took her, Briseis girl, my prize, given by the army. If you can, stand by me, go to Olympos, pray to Zeus, if ever by word or deed you served him, and so you did, I often heard you tell it in father's house, that time when you alone of all the gods shielded the son of Kronos from peril and disgrace when other gods, Pallas Athena, Hera, and Poseidon, wished him in irons, wished to keep him bound, you had the will to free him of that bondage, and called up to Olympos in all haste Aegean, whom the gods call Briareus, the giant with a hundred arms. More powerful than the sea god, his father. 
down he sat by the son of Kronos, glorying in that place. For fear of him the blissful gods forbore to manacle Zeus. Remind him of these things, cling to his knees and tell him your good pleasure if he will take the Trojan side and roll the Achaeans back to the water's edge, back on the ships with slaughter. All the troops may savor what their king has won for them, and he may know his madness, what he lost when he dishonored me, peerless among Achaeans. Her eyes filled, and a tear fell as she answered, Alas, my child, why did I rear you, doomed the day I bore you? Ah, could you only be serene upon this beachhead through the siege, your life runs out so soon. O oh, early death! O oh, broken heart! No destiny so cruel! And I bore you to this evil. But what you wish I will propose to Zeus, lord of the lightning, going up myself into the snow glare of Olympos with hope for his consent. Be quiet now beside the long ships, keep your anger bright against the army, quit the war. Last night Zeus made a journey to the shore of ocean to feast among the sunburned, and the gods accompanied him. In twelve days he will come back to Olympos. Then I shall be there to cross his bronze dorsal and take his knees. I trust I'll move him. The Tis left her son still burning for the softly belted girl whom they had wrested from him. Meanwhile Odysseus with his shipload of offerings came to cries. Entering the deep harbour there they furled the sails and stowed them, and unbent four stays to ease the mast down quickly aft into its rest, then rowed her to a mooring. Bow stones were dropped, and they tied up astern, and all stepped out into the wash and ebb, then disembarked their cattle for the archer, and Chrysais, from the deep sea ship. Odysseus, the great tactician, led her to the altar, putting her in her father's hands, and said, Chrysais, as Agamemnon's emissary I bring your child to you, and for Apollo a hecatom in the Danaan's name. We trust in this way to appease your lord, who sent down pain and sorrow on the Argives. So he delivered her, and the priest received her, the child so dear to him, in joy. Then hastening to give the god his hecatom, they led bullocks to crowd around the compact altar, rinsed their hands and delved in barley baskets, as open-armed to heaven Chrysis prayed, O oh, hear me, master of the silver bow, protector of Tenedos and the holy towns, if while I prayed you listened once before and honoured me, and punished the Achaeans, now let my wish come true again. But turn your plague away this time from the Danans. And this petition, too, Apollo heard. When prayers were said and grains of barley strewn, they held the bullocks for the knife, and flayed them, cutting out joints and wrapping these in fat, two layers, folded, with raw strips of flesh, for the old man to burn on cloven faggots, wetting it all with wine. Around him stood young men with five tined forks in hand, and when the vitals had been tasted, joints consumed, they sliced the chines and quarters for the spits, roasted them evenly and drew them off. Their meal being now prepared and all work done, they feasted to their heart's content and made desire for meat and drink recede again, then young men filled their wine bowls to the brim, ladling drops for the god in every cup. Propitiatory songs rose clear and strong until day's end, to praise the god, Apollo, as one who keeps the plague afar, and listening the god took joy. After the sun went down and darkness came, at last Odysseus' men lay down to rest under the stern hawsers. When dawn spread out her fingertips of rose they put to sea for the main camp of Achaeans, and the archer god sent them a following wind. Stepping the mast they shook their canvas out, and wind caught, bellying the sail. A foaming dark blue wave sang backward from the bow as the running ship made way against the sea, until they came offshore of the encampment. Here they put in and hauled the black ship high, far up the sand, braced her with shoring timbers, and then disbanded, each to his own hut. Meanwhile unstirring and with smouldering heart, the godlike athlete, son of Peleus, Prince Achilles waited by his racing ships. He would not enter the assembly of emulous men, nor ever go to war, but felt his valour staling in his breast with idleness, and missed the cries of battle. Now when in fact twelve days had passed, the gods who live forever turned back to Olympos, with Zeus in power supreme among them. The Tis had kept in mind her mission for her son, and rising like a dawn mist from the sea into a cloud she soared aloft in heaven to high Olympos. Zeus with massive brows she found apart, on the chief crest enthroned, and slipping down before him, her left hand placed on his knees and her right hand held up to cup his chin, she made her plea to him, O Father Zeus, if ever amid immortals by word or deed I served you, grant my wish and see to my son's honour. Doom for him of all men comes on quickest. Now Lord Marshal Agamemnon has been high-handed with him, has commandeered and holds his prize of war. But you can make him pay for this, profound mind of Olympos. Lend the Trojans power, until the Achaeans recompense my son and heap new honour upon him. 
When she finished, the gatherer of cloud said never a word but sat unmoving for a long time, silent. The tees clung to his knees, then spoke again, give your infallible word, and bow your head, or else reject me. Can you be afraid to let me see how low in your esteem I am of all the gods? Greatly perturbed, Lord Zeus who masses cloud said, here is trouble. You drive me into open war with Hera sooner or later, she will be at me, scolding all day long. Even as matters stand she never rests from badgering me before the gods, I take the Trojan side in battle, so she says. Go home before you are seen. But you can trust me to put my mind on this, I shall arrange it. Here let me bow my head, then be content to see me bound by that most solemn act before the gods. My word is not revocable nor ineffectual, once I nod upon it. He bent his ponderous black brows down, and locks ambrosial of his immortal head swung over them, as all Olympos trembled. After this pact they parted, Misty the Tees from glittering Olympos leapt away into the deep sea, Zeus to his hall retired. There all the gods rose from their seats in deference before their father, not one dared face him unmoved, but all stood up before him, and thus he took his throne. But Hera knew he had new interests, she had seen the goddess the Tees, silver-footed daughter of the old one of the sea, conferring with him, and, nagging, she inquired of Zeus Cronion, who is it this time, Schema? Who has your ear? How fond you are of secret plans, of taking decisions privately. You could not bring yourself, could you, to favor me with any word of your new plot? The father of gods and men said in reply, Hera, all my provisions you must not itch to know. You'll find them rigorous, consult though you are. In all appropriate matters no one else, no god or man, shall be advised before you. But when I choose to think alone, don't harry me about it with your questions. The Lady Hera answered, with wide eyes, Majesty, what a thing to say. I have not harried you before with questions, surely, you are quite free to tell what you will tell. This time I dreadfully fear I have a feeling that he's, the silver-footed daughter of the old one of the sea, led you astray. Just now at daybreak, anyway, she came to sit with you and take your knees, my guess is you bowed your head for her in solemn pact that you will see to the honour of Achilles that is, to Achaean carnage near the ships. Now Zeus the gatherer of clouds said, Marvellous, you and your guesses, you are near it, too. But there is not one thing that you can do about it, only estrange yourself still more from me all the more gall for you. If what you say is true, you may be sure it pleases me. And now you just sit down, be still, obey me, or else not all the gods upon Olympos can help in the least when I approach your chair to lay my inexorable hands upon you. At this the wide-eyed Lady Hera feared him, and sat quite still, and bent her will to his. Up through the hall of Zeus now all the lords of heaven were sullen and looked askance. Hephaestos, master artificer, broke the silence, doing a kindness to the snowy-armed lady, his mother Hera. He began, ah, what a miserable day, if you two raise your voices over mortal creatures. More than enough already. Must you bring your noisy bickering among the gods? What pleasure can we take in a fine dinner when baser matters gain the upper hand? To mother my advice is what she knows better make up to father, or he'll start his thundering and shake our feast to bits. You know how he can shock us if he cares to out of our seats with lightning bolts. Supreme power is his. Oh, soothe him, please, take a soft tone, get back in his good graces. Then he'll be benign to us again. He lurched up as he spoke, and held a wine cup out to her, a double-handed one, and said, Dear mother, patience, hold your tongue, no matter how upset you are. I would not see you battered, dearest. It would hurt me, and yet I could not help you, not a bit. The Olympian is difficult to oppose. One other time I took your part he caught me around one foot and flung me into the sky from our tremendous terrace. I soared all day. Just as the sun dropped down I dropped down, too, on Lemnos nearly dead. The island people nursed a fallen god. He made her smile and the goddess, white-armed Hera, smiling took the wine cup from his hand. Then, dipping from the wine bowl, round he went from left to right, serving the other gods nectar of sweet delight. And quenchless laughter broke out among the blissful gods to see Hephaistos wheezing down the hall. So all day long until the sun went down they spent in feasting, and the measured feast matched well their heart's desire. So did the flawless harp held by Apollo and heavenly songs inquiring Antiphon that all the muses sang. And when the shining sun of day sank in the west, they turned homeward each one to rest, each to that home the bandelegged wondrous artisan Hephaistos fashioned for them with his craft.
the lord of storm and lightning, Zeus, retired and shut his eyes where sweet sleep ever came to him, and at his side lay Hera, goddess of the golden chair.